Hello and welcome to part 3 of my Monitors and Displays 101 series. This video talks about OLED and other self-emissive display technologies, as well as a bit about the future of where monitors and displays are going. If you haven't seen it yet, part 1 talks about the essentials as well as LCDs versus CRTs, and part 2 talks about the various types of LCDs, including TN, VA, IPS panels, as well as different backlighting technologies. If you haven't seen those yet, feel free to check those out first. On to the discussion of OLEDs and self-emissive panels. Finally, I think we can move on to the last type of display, which is OLEDs. Yeah, IPS. Oh, I should mention, like, IP, as I said, there's a lot of IPS-like. HWVA, even though it has VA in the name, is actually an IPS panel, hyper-wide viewing angle. There is a, what's the other one? Samsung used to call it PLS. Instead of in-plane switching, they call it plane-to-line switching. But it's actually the same thing. They just don't want to. Those are the, these are the cool ones. Cause, so finally, since like 2020, these are starting to take over. And in a lot of ways, LCDs were downgrades compared to CRTs. Because CRTs are basically self-emissive, they had very good black levels. LCDs don't. Because it's self-emissive, basically, they had no motion blur. LCDs have a lot of motion blur in comparison. So in a lot of ways, we took the backs for the form factor and whatnot. Uh, OLED and especially microLED are kind of like the best of both worlds. Now, OLED has fundamental downsides, major, major downsides that we'll talk about. But overall, much better. Basically, we take this image here, and it's one panel. There's no backlight because the LED themselves are the backlight. So you'll essentially have lots and lots of LEDs. And instead of using the LEDs to light a panel, which then shines through an, like, by panel, I mean like a pane of glass or whatever, which shines through an LCD, we get rid of all of that. The LEDs just face forwards. And if you want red, you turn the red LEDs on. If you want blue, you turn the blue LEDs on. If you want green, you turn the green LEDs on, so on and so forth. Of these, there are a couple types of OLED panels. For example, uh, these days Samsung is producing what are called quantum dot QD OLED panels. And uh, that just means that well, there's ways of getting red, green, and blue, right? Uh, so traditionally, you would use white LEDs because, well, red, green, blues weren't like... Okay, so when I talk about why do you need OLEDs instead of normal LEDs, normal LEDs are too big. You can't put... Nor you can make displays out of normal LEDs. If you've been to, like, a concert hall or a massive venue, instead of using projectors, they might use, like, LED video walls. You kind of need that scale for LED displays to work. We can't really make them too much smaller because as small as they are, they're not small enough for this to uh, properly work. Um, so that's why OLED and uh, micro LED especially are interesting because then we can actually start making these in reasonable uh, form factors. So uh, traditionally, then you would use white LEDs, except the white LEDs, then you would have to color the top of them as red, green, blue to be able to get RGB. Um, not great, but it works. You might have heard of Samsung called uh, AMOLED displays. AMOLED displays are fundamentally uh, OLED. The AM just stands for active matrix. So on a phone, if you have an AMOLED display, that's just an active matrix OLED display. It's kind of more marketing. It doesn't make it particularly special. Um, uh, QD OLEDs are interesting because instead of using white LEDs, they actually use blue or UV LEDs um, or near purple LEDs. And then they will use quantum dots in order to, uh, which can basically take and change the wavelength of the light from blue to green and red. And that's cool because they're just like lasers. You can get very, very, very precise wavelengths out of these, which means that your colors can be like a much deeper red, a much deeper green, a much deeper blue. To get a deep red, a deep green, to deep blue, you want to narrow down uh, the wavelength of light to one specific frequency. So this is why, for example, laser projectors can get uh, pretty wide color gamuts because you're producing precisely and only pure red, pure green, pure blue, just because of how lasers work. And quantum dots can do something very, very similar, where you get very pure amounts of red, green, blue. The other, uh, so that's QD OLED. QD OLED today is probably the best type of OLED you can buy. Although there's only a couple displays on TVs using it for displays. The only one's a 34-inch panel. Uh, the other type that's used by LG typically is called W OLED. W OLED stands for white OLED. Essentially, OLEDs have this problem where, on a big scale, they're not very bright because they'll burn in. So what WOLED does is it adds a white subpixel. So instead of being RGB, these are actually RGBW. And Windows sometimes freaks out with OLEDs and you get text fringing. And we'll talk about why that happens. It has to do with subpixel rendering and relates to this diagram. But basically, the way an OLED monitor works is exactly as I said. Instead of having all of these filters, the pixels themselves light up and emit the light that you see. That's the fundamental principle. Um, they work much, much better because this means that when I have a black scene on the screen, the pixels just turn off. 
which means that you get pitch black because there's, well, no light that's being emitted from the display. So you get much lower black levels. You get much short, uh, faster response times because LEDs are pretty much instantaneous to respond. They can instantly turn on and turn off. In fact, they're so fast that you can get away with using schemes like pulse width modulation in order to actually change the levels of them, which wouldn't basically be possible with an LCD. The response time of the LCD will take over and balance it out. With the LEDs, they can actually turn on and off fast enough. And this means that you also get pretty much no motion blur. So they have a lot of advantages. Um, Uh, the downside is, however, OLEDs are susceptible to burn-in. And that's because these are organic molecules. The more you actually, uh, the brighter you run them, you will eventually end up burning out the pixel itself. Uh, and this means that, you know, this is very common, you'll see it on phone screens or on this, like TVs that have been showing the same thing for a long time. Now, OLEDs have started to get better, so burn-in is becoming less and less of an issue every day. Uh, but however, it's still the major downside, as well as price. They're really expensive. <laughs> should include that as well. Oh yeah, and with these, you can of course say this is a, an IPSS. So if that's a dollar, two dollars, this is like five dollar signs. So very pricey, um, but you're, we're slowly starting to see old ads in, uh, shipping with uh, modern TVs, as well as some computer monitors. Finally, LG has announced at CES their 27 and 45 inch uh, OLEDs, which can do 240 hertz because, of course, I mean, they're so fast that why wouldn't you run them at 120 or 240 hertz? Running them at 60 almost feels like a waste. As, I mean, as if the electronics are fast enough to keep up. Um, but they all have burning issues. And we'll have to see how this plays out. There's lots of things you can do, like pixel cleaning, but all pixel cleaning does is like, burn everything else out to match the burnt out sections. So like, it's more so masking the problem than fixing it. And there's lots of uh, things that they'll do. For example, they'll do pixel shift, which means uh, they're actually very similar to plasma displays in terms of how plasmas work. Plasma never made it big in the computer space, but it was kind of big in the TV space for a while. So we can talk, uh, I'll do a comparison to plasmas shortly. Um, but you'll get pixel shifting, which means that the image will move left, right, up, down by a couple pixels, just so that if you have hard edges, like a border between a black and a white section, uh, you won't end up getting the same thing for, you know, you won't end up burning out just the white pixels. That will gradually shift it so that you get a smoother transition. Also, screensavers maybe will make a comeback. And the other thing you'll notice is with HDR, obviously these are going to be a lot better because, well, your contrast is infinite because black is black. The thing is, OLEDs are typically power capped, which means that on a, mass, on a big TV, if I only have like a tiny rectangle, that tiny rectangle can be very bright. Even on computer models, it can be 1,000, 2,000 nits. But the bigger that rectangle gets, the darker I have to run the display, because otherwise you'll hit a power cap, you'll produce way too much heat, you will burn all the pixels. So they're typically um, power limited, which means that the bigger of an area you have lit, the dimmer the display gets. That's typically fine for stuff like HDR, because only a small fraction of the scene really needs to be very bright, but it is something to consider. Now, I said Windows likes to freak out when you have OLEDs, and the reason is for something like a QD OLED display, the display is actually using triangular circles. Um. Since I mentioned sub-pixel rendering and pixel arrangements, I wanted to give a couple of demonstrations. These are just sample pictures I've taken just with my macro camera on my phone. And to start with, here's a close-up of a regular LCD panel. This is one for my TV because it's easier to see the pixels, but it's the same for computer monitors. You can see that all the pixels are square, and within each pixel we can see the red, green, and blue sub-pixels. This is typically called a normal RGB pixel layout. If this was sideways, it would be vertical RGB or vertical BGR. Some panels use BGR, but realistically, those are all pretty standard and Windows can deal with them. So what you're seeing here is the color white being shown, and that's because all of the red, green, and blue subpixels are all lit. Now let's look at some OLEDs for comparison. For comparison, here's the subpixel layout of a QD OLED. This picture is from the Alienware 32-inch QD OLED monitor, the one that uses the Samsung QD OLED panel. Um, in this case, you can see that the pixels are in a triangular arrangement. So we can see that, for example, at the very top row, you can see the lit row of green dots with the red and blue dots underneath it. Unfortunately, th since this is a relatively small monitor, it's not perfectly in focus, but I think the point's pretty clear. You can see that um, since Windows is expecting there to be three rectangles in the order of red, green, blue. And in this case, we're getting triangles with green on top and red and blue on the bottom. Um, text that's supposed to be using that anti-aliasing method is going to have look well is going to have color fringing. But 
here you can actually see a close-up of some text on this monitor. So this is for a given uh, folder, a given directory on the desktop. So at the top you see the icon for a directory on Windows and you can see that the gradual fade out isn't great. And at the bottom you can see the text uh, released and description for the directory. And you can see that there's like blue bleeding into the left hand side and, and red bleeding onto the right hand side just as a result of how Windows is trying to anti-alias this and failing. What makes QD OLED how deep the colors they display can get. So you're seeing the Alienware 34 inch QD OLED monitor in comparison to my laptop which is a ThinkPad T14 Gen 2. The exact panel that it has is linked on my website. But you can see when it's supposed to be showing red, the laptop looks orange by comparison. Nowhere near the same saturated red that the QD OLED can show. Finally, this is a picture of a W OLED monitor. This one comes from the Corsair Xenion Flex which is a 45 inch panel. And you can see that it not only has red, green, blue, but also a white subpixel that is lit. And in this case, I just have some text in the middle and you can see how there is the red, green, and blue artifacting around it. Just because once again, Windows doesn't know how to deal with RGBW subpixels. Let's see some more examples. Here's a really simple one. This is just the AMD logo that you can see on RGBW. And finally, here's some more text that you can see. Once again, you will notice that the board, especially the uh, borders around the letters have particular issues. Now, if you can switch to using grayscale subpixel rendering, most of these concerns are alleviated. But I wanted to just point these out in person so you can decide for yourself whether these are deal breakers with an OLED panel or not. There have been various types of it. In the past, displays would use uh, red and green squares, and like the blue would be like a bigger rectangle, and so especially on some of the older OLED laptops, you can uh, see this effect where, well, Windows doesn't really know what to do with it because how t Windows text rendering works is that's a completely separate uh, topic, but for subpixel rendering, essentially, in order to anti-alias text, so if text was basically just running the pixels black and white, it tends to look very, very jagged. So in order to make this better, Windows does anti-aliasing. If, if you've done any gaming, you know what anti-aliasing is. Um, won't get too deep into it, but essentially you'll, uh, smoothen that line out to do uh, gray on the sides. Um, and so that's AA. Uh, but Windows then does uh, subpixel rendering on that. So basically, run the display at triple the horizontal resolution because we can then further break down the pixel into RGB. So if I have a line that I'm trying to render like this through the section, well, I can make this one very bright, this one darker, this one darker. And on average, it will help me get that rendering, as opposed to just doing you know, grayscale subpixel rendering. So it's good because it makes text look smoother. But the problem is, it's always expecting this RGB pattern. And if you have a display mounted vertically, you might have had to do redo calibration, because that's going to completely throw it off track, because now my pixels are sideways. There are some monitors that use BGR, where the panel is essentially upside down. Those are also fundamentally different, because uh, so on Windows, this is, by the way, called clear type. You'll have to do clear type calibration. The thing is, clear type works with RGB in any of the four directions. It has no idea what to do with these pixels, where the R, G are on one row, and they're square, and the B is on the next row, and it's a rectangular. It doesn't know how to deal with that and how to anti-alias if a line is being drawn across it. So you tend to get these colors fringing on text. And the fringing is happening because Windows thinks that it's what it's actually doing is it's helping smoothen that out over the RGB. But what it's actually doing is what it thinks is RGB isn't actually RGB. They're not side by side. So you end up with, if, the, if you had a line going here, it's like, well, I'll add a little bit of blue to help smoothen it. But the blue isn't actually at the right of a pixel. <laughs> You're lighting up the row below it. So you tend to get that uh, fringing. On Linux, this isn't the problem. If you use grayscale uh, anti-aliasing, you won't get this issue at all. And with QD OLEDs, of course, it's different again because now we switch from this arrangement over to this arrangement using the triangular uh, triangles full of the three circles. So various things in use. I think LG does for their W OLEDs. It's like a square with four pixels. The point is, it's different. And well, eventually computers will learn how to deal with it. But at the moment, that's one downside of it. Now, I said that the main downside of OLEDs is that they're susceptible to burn in. That's because these are organic LEDs. Uh, and as I said, that's because normal LEDs aren't small enough and efficient enough to use on OLED panels. Well, that's what micro-LED fixes. So micro-LED is very impressive because it goes back to using the traditional inorganic LEDs that we know and love. This means that they can run a lot brighter and they don't burn in as often because it's just typical inorganic chemicals that you'd see on normal LEDs. So micro-LED is 
pretty hyped at the moment. It's designed to um, basically it's all the advantages of OLED without the downsides other than the cost. Instead of five dollar signs, maybe at ten. And the fact that we can't really manufacture them at large sc uh, scales at the moment. So you, there are a couple micro LED video walls on the market uh, that you can do by tiling these up. However, they're few and far in between, and they're not at a scale where you can go and buy. So they're not, not really not on the markets yet. By the time I edit and upload this video, maybe they will be. And finally, I want to draw a quick conclusion between OLED and plasma. Now, plasma was popular back in the day uh, before LCDs really took over. So think mid-2000s to 2010s, you were still seeing plasma displays, especially with even at 720p, maybe even 1080p, maybe even 3D displays. That's because plasma has a lot of the advantages of OLED. Just like OLED, it's self-emissive. Just like OLED, it has very good black levels. It has very fast response times. In fact, it came around the age when pre-TN, like very blurry LCDs were the only types of LCDs you could get. So if you want to do anything like watch sports or whatever, and you didn't want motion blur across your whole screen, plasmas were your go-to. Um, they were really heavy because they were pure glass, but it's not really a concern. The main thing, though, is uh, just like OLEDs, they were susceptible to burning. And eventually they fell because LCDs fell in price, uh, as, I think as far as I can say about it. Uh, very, very similar to uh, OLEDs, though, though because um, they're self-emissive. It's just instead of LEDs lighting the display, we have plasma. Kind of exotic when you think about it. Really is a fun thing that was really popular for a while, uh, but then I guess died down. I think 2010s is when all of the big manufacturers, your Panasonic and whatnot, started shutting down their lines. But you had, all, you had most of the advantages. I mean, I can't say much about color gamut because back then TVs used the BT601 color space, which isn't very white to begin with. And most things were SD anyway. HD was like just starting to happen. But yes, very fast response times, no motion blur, but had burning issues. So it kind of is uh, falls alongside the same family of OLED and micro LED that it was self-emissive. But that's a thing of the past. Maybe it was too far in the future for its time. Um, and then LCD happened, and now we're switching back to it. And I think that about wraps this up. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching the third and final part of my Monitors and Displays 101 series. If you want to see the full one-hour video, it is linked in the description down below. Part one and part two, if you haven't seen it yet, are also linked down there. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing to the channel. And thank you so much for watching. See you next time. With that said, I hope this has been a good overall introduction um, and that I've been able to explain the fundamentals of CRTs versus LCDs versus OLEDs and self-emissive displays, as well as the different types of LCDs you see, like LED backlit, mini LED backlit, as well as the types of panels, TN, VA, IPS. Uh, I hope this was a good overall introduction and helped explain the key concepts and the fundamentals. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the comments down below or uh, send me an email. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching. <laughs>